There are three primary configurations for a BJT used as an amplifier. Common bass, common collector, and common emitter. There's a million different ways to make amplifiers with them, of course, but these are the fundamental three. The idea is you have an input signal and an output signal, and common bass, common collector, common emitter indicates which leg of the transistor the input and output signals have in common. I find that a little confusing and it's weird to explain, so... I just don't worry about it. Basically, common base means neither signal is applied to the base. Common emitter means neither signal is applied to the emitter. Like, you know, a common emitter amplifier, the input is on the base, the output is taken from the collector, so the emitter is just there. Common collector we'll get into in the future. Right now, it's common base. You can use a single or dual-sided power supply. We'll just use a single right now. You have the same bias element as usual, a simple voltage divider, and the output is taken from the collector. You have your standard collector resistor and emitter resistor. The bias is applied to the base. There's your load connected to the collector. So that's the output, and the input is applied to the emitter. So input on the emitter, output from the collector, and the base is just biased. So common base, neither signal is applied at the base. There's one final element. With a common emitter amplifier, you would have a capacitor parallel with the emitter resistor so that the signal had access to ground, to circuit ground, through a low impedance path because a capacitor is low impedance to AC. And then the DC bias would be across the emitter resistor. This is actually a similar thing. The signal is applied to the emitter and the capacitor is over here. So the signal does go through the emitter resistor, but it goes back up through this capacitor, and what it is is a low impedance path to base, to the base, and it travels through the circuit ground. So the signal changing voltage will change the current across the emitter resistor, then a low impedance path through this collector, and it changes the current at the base, which the transistor amplifies because it's a BJT, and there will be a voltage between the base and collector. In the next video, I'll show you on the simulator so it's easier to see, but for now, take my word for it. There will be a voltage across the base collector. This voltage swing is going to match the voltage swing on the output, and it's based on the collector current and the collector resistance. This is an interesting little circuit because it doesn't amplify current, it amplifies voltage. Your emitter is where the input current is applied, the collector is where the output current is supplied, and we know that a BJT has a beta of, you know, 40, 100, 125, so the base current is going to be very, very small compared to the collector current, and the emitter current is collector plus base current. So the collector current that's available to the output is going to be very, very slightly less than the emitter current. It won't be the same, but it'll only be slightly less. They'll be almost the same. So... The current actually goes down a little bit, but mostly not at all. But what happens is proportional to the load and collector voltage, as determined by Ohm's law, the current through them, their resistance makes a voltage. It's a voltage amplifier. So it uses the current to amplify the voltage. So as it turns out, you want a very small swing in current here. The more the current changes, the more beta is unstable. So you want a very small swing in the current and you want the resistance to do the work to give you a voltage, which you could buffer later. This is purely for signal. So it's only for small signal. You're not going to amplify large signals with this. In addition, it's for high-frequency signals. If you have a low-frequency signal, there's a whole bunch of inconvenient physical details I won't get into. But from what I read, the higher the frequency, to a point, there will be a max frequency your transistor can operate at. But to a certain extent, the higher the frequency, the more those little physical realities kind of go away. They become insignificant. Sort of how base current is insignificant to collector current. It, it gets cleaner and nicer. So this circuit is not really used very much, but it is common or prevalent in high frequency radio applications. You have a small signal, you have a high frequency signal, and you want to amplify the signal. And you can worry about power amplification later, you can buffer it. So it's really great for that. Me personally, I discovered this circuit when I was trying to do oscillators, LC tank oscillators, and it's the only one that they would work with, but more on that in the future. So what is the gain here? Well, if we say A the gain, it's V out over V in. That's just what gain is. We want to see how much 
the output voltage goes up compared to the input. And since we're connected to the collector and the emitter, it's the voltage across the collector, voltage across the emitter, or at the collector and emitter, really. And since we have resistance on both ends, we can use Ohm's law. So it's the current through the collector, resistance at the collector, current through the emitter, resistance at the emitter. But we've already established that the collector and emitter currents are mostly the same. There's very little difference, and the better quality your transistor, the less difference there will be. So the better the parts, the more IC over IE is just one, or almost one. So we could really just take that away. And it's the ratio of the resistances, which is your gain. Now one thing to keep in mind for the collector is that you've got your actual, you know, RC here, but then you've got RL, and these are in parallel. So your collector resistance, your collector impedance, is not just this resistor, but also your load. So what you do is you can increase your load, and that increases the gain. Only to a point, though, if you increase load too much, because you see you have this capacitor, and this capacitor is going to charge to the bias. First of all, if you have like 10 mega ohms, like my oscilloscope probe, it'll actually take you know, seconds, dozens and dozens of seconds for this bias to actually go away for the capacitor to fully charge when you turn it on. So if you had a really high load, you would want to have something in parallel you could switch on and off to give it a little boost right when you turn it on. But you really don't need that big of a load. I've been using 10k ohm resistors for the load, and it seems to work just fine. I will get more into parts picking in the next video after I show you the numbers on the simulator. Right now I'm just going over how the circuit works. But keep in mind that RC and RL here are in parallel. But what about RE? The base emitter junction of a BJT has something called dynamic emitter resistance, which they mark as lowercase r apostrophe lowercase e. I don't know why I've been afraid to look, but that's what they write. So basically, it's just the internal resistance because this is a semiconductor. This is not just a wire in here. It's a semiconductor, so it has a certain resistance. But the trick is, the more heat there is, the hotter it is, the less resistance. As a transistor gets warmer, it conducts better. And more current means more heat. So essentially, the more current, the more heat, the less resistance. There's some fancy math people do using the laws of electronics, and this RE, R apostrophe E, roughly comes out to 25 millivolts over the emitter current. It just is. There's a lot of calculus. Let's not worry about it. So 25 millivolts over the emitter current. And as you can see, as the emitter current increases, the whole thing decreases. So this is, of course, in ohms. You know, it's, it's really Ohm's law. Voltage equals current times resistance, so resistance equals voltage divided by current. A transistor is not an ohmic device, but it works out this way. So you do this calculation based on the emitter resistance, and you get something in ohms. And just like the collector and the load being in parallel, the emitter resistor and this resistor are in parallel. When doing something called small signal analysis, which is a whole thing on its own. So the real relation is RC in parallel with RL over RE in parallel with R apostrophe E. So R apostrophe E is 25 millivolts divided by the emitter current. For just a single milliamp of emitter current, that goes down to only 25 ohms. And every little bit above that makes it go down even further. So the first thing is to realize that the gain is proportional to this resistance. So if your current is changing a lot, that resistance is changing a lot, that effective resistance, dynamic emitter resistance. And so your gain is changing a lot, and that is signal distortion. So this is another illustration of why small signals work better, so that this RE does not change too terribly much. The other thing is, this R apostrophe E is incredibly small compared to emitter resistor. Like 25 ohms here, and even 100 ohms, which is small. Emitter resistor of 100 ohms is pretty small. But even that small, it's only a quarter. And parallel resistance, 1 over R total equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. If you have a very small R2, that's going to make this quotient very large. Much larger than this one, because this one 
a larger resistance would make this a smaller number. So the smaller resistance begins to dominate the larger resistance when they're in parallel. This is how multimeters and oscilloscopes work. You can apply a huge resistance in parallel and it's not going to do much. The smaller one is going to dominate. So another approximation is RE doesn't much matter. It does. All of these things that we're getting rid of do matter. But the point is this matters much, much more. And the illustration here is that you need a small signal. So that's really what this is saying. So a lot of times when I look it up, you'll just see collector resistor over RE. So this is why a huge voltage gain for a small signal. So your voltage divider gives you, if we, if we talk about quiescence, right, where there's no loads, let me get rid of these. With no loads attached, we talk about the quiescence, the equilibrium of this whole circuit, this class A amplifier that's always on. We bias it, so it's always on. It's inefficient for power, but it's great for signal reproduction quality. So if we disconnect the loads, this is the baseline, and then the input modifies the baseline, and then we take the output. So your voltage divider gives you your bias voltage at quiescence. You have a certain base emitter voltage drop, so your emitter voltage is just bias minus that. And then your emitter current is voltage divided by resistance. You can calculate your R apostrophe E from that current, and then you get your rough gain. Of course, nothing's being amplified, but it's just baseline. And then when you do connect the input, you have that quiescence that's going on all the time. The base emitter is always forward biased. And then your signal goes in and out because it's through the capacitor, so it pushes more current or it pulls, so some current some current extra is going in through this resistor or some is being diverted from the emitter to not go through the resistor. And then that's an AC signal voltage change over the emitter resistor. But more importantly, it's a current change AC that goes through this capacitor and into the base. And you end up with a matching current swing. Current swing here is current swing there. And then the current swing is amplified, a greater current swing here, which goes across your higher, much higher impedance up there and gives you a voltage with a very small change in current overall that keeps the amplifier stable. And the transistor, of course, you'll want to heat sink your transistor so that the temperature stays nice and steady. That'll help too. And like I said, I'll go into parts picking in the next video after the simulator run so you can see how the currents really work. But in reality, the whole thing is kind of a mess because you have to add the capacitors and these give you impedance. There's a, there's a reactance across the capacitor, which affects the whole thing. On the common emitter circuit, it's just applying through the base and it's like having extra resistance. It doesn't much matter. But here, it's much, 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 much more sensitive to the capacitor choices. So what I've found is I just have to do it in a simulator, do it on a breadboard and switch parts in and out, and you'll kind of figure out the best arrangement. You can do the math and get a baseline, but from there you'll have to experiment. So you keep the signal small to not swing the current too much. You heat sink the transistor to make sure that the temperature stays as close to steady as possible. And then you can look at the data sheet and choose your, your currents and voltages and figure out your parts to put you in the most stable region of beta gain, HFE, for your transistor. And all of that is going to minimize your signal distortion. So you'll get a nice big voltage that you can then buffer and do something else with. So real quick, let me show you this circuit in action. I will make all this more clear in the next video when I show you on the simulator, but I have a standard 2N3904 NPN. I've got an 18K and an 8.2K resistor for the bias. I've got 1K on the emitter, 2.2K on the collector, and 10K as the load. My oscilloscope probe is in parallel with the load. The other probe is on the signal, so you can see that. And the capacitors I'm using are all one microfarad. I'm using a signal, which is 1 kilohertz, plus or minus 0.2 volts, 400 millivolts peak to peak, sine wave. And then I'm using a single-sided 12 volt supply. And there we go. 
So if I size this graph so it fits nice on the screen, so that's 430, so I'll put the other one at 430 as well. So they're both at the same vertical scale, and you can see the gain is quite significant. And if I shrink the time, if you hopefully you can see green on yellow. If you can't, you know, just take my word for it. You've got a very, very strong amplification of your small input signal. If I bring it down to something I can do the math easier on, so this is about... 3 volts on a 1 kilohertz signal. So that's cool. And then of course you'll want to buffer the signal. Because if you try to drive a load with this, it's going to mess with it, so you got to buffer it. In the next video I'll show you with the simulator so you can see all the details of what the currents and voltages are doing throughout these parts. And then we'll go over how to choose your parts, at least initially, so you can apply a signal in the frequency range you're interested in and get it to a reasonable gain level. So for now, I'll be seeing you.